Hello. Hello, Peter. Hello. So, what is your name? Michael Pattinson. Hello, Mike. Hi. Um, you have been in Scientology for a long time. Yes. Uh, for how many years altogether? Um, I was in for about 23 years in total. 22, yes. 23 years. And you started where? Uh, in Paris, in, in Paris. 1973. Yes. You have been there as a student? or? Yes, I was a student. Uh, to start off with, I was a student and then uh, graduated up from there. Uh -huh. And how did they recruit you there? Um, basically, I was um, having some uh, health problems at the time. Mm -hmm. I was looking for some kind of a solution to that, and a, a student doctor from England sent me the book Dianetics. Mm -hmm. So I read that, and I decided this was worth trying. So I went to try it mm -hmm. in Paris. And so you made the first courses in, in Paris? Yes, that's right. Mm -hmm. In, in uh, English, though. In English? Yes. That's all, only in English at that time? Right? Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, from that time on, in, from 1975, uh, Oh, 73, 73, 73, that's right. 73, how it went on with your Scientology career? Um, I actually joined staff um, in 1975 uh, for a brief time. Where? Uh, in Paris, that's and I was sent to F Copenhagen mm -hmm. um, to do some training in Copenhagen before going to the, uh, to the ship, the Apollo. Mm -hmm. And so I was doing preparations for about, well, maybe almost five or six months up in Copenhagen, Denmark. Mm -hmm. And then I was sent on mission unexpectedly for a couple of months in Vienna, in mm -hmm. Austria. But you started then going from Paris, going to Copenhagen? That's right. And what kind of job you have done in Copenhagen for? Just training <coughs> and, uh, you know, learning Scientology and doing courses and getting a little auditing and uh, doing this kind of thing. And what kind of uh, direction training? Uh, auditor training. Dianetics. Auditor. Yes, Dianetics auditor. That you can work as an auditor yes. outside? that's right. Within the organization? That's right. And then after six months, you uh, went on a mission to the Apollo ship where... No, to the to Vienna organization. A direct from Copenhagen to Vienna. That's right, yes. Uh -huh. And for how long you stayed in, in Vienna? It was a couple of months I was there. In 1975? That's right, in mm -hmm. uh, October and November. Mm -hmm. And what was your job there? Um, I was sent down because the Vienna organization was not doing very well and uh, they wanted somebody to supervise the course room mm -hmm. at that time. So I established the new course room status it was it was pretty bad off mm -hmm. there had been some staff members who were not doing a very good job mm -hmm. and uh, so I was doing the uh, the courses there it's funny because that was the time I met uh, Julia McGuinness Johnson uh -huh. she was on the course she was one of the students at that time in Vienna organization mm -hmm. she's a wonderful <coughs> woman and she started there also uh, yes yes well no she was um she was um, on the Apollo she was one of uh, Ron Hubbard's stewards personal stewards mm -hmm. She used to cook for him and uh, prepare his clothes and his rooms and things like that. Julia McGuinness? Yes, Julia McGuinness, yes. Mm -hmm. And then um, she decided that she'd like to have a career in acting. And so she went um, off at that time to Vienna and she was in the Volksoffer. Uh -huh. And she was performing in the Volksoffer and uh, she was also at the same time coming on course in Scientology. Mm -hmm. um, and she's, she's a wonderful person. Mm -hmm. And with whom you went on mission to Vienna? To Vienna, who was your boss there? Um, but my boss there was Guillaume Le Sèvre, who is now the executive director international. That means one of the highest people within yes. the organization now. That's right. He was your boss there. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yes. And he uh, and Vanessa, his wife. At that time, uh, the Austrian painter Gottfried Helmer was also in Scientology. He started there. Yes, he was. He was. Um, he was in the mission in Vienna with Tony Morel. Mm -hmm. I don't remember the address, but it was a very. It was like an apartment, mm -hmm. and I went there uh, to visit. And what was Helmine's function? Um, he was um, he was a partner in running the mission mm -hmm. in uh, Vienna, as far as I understand. So he was a high, of, he was a, a top Scientologist there in Austria. Yes, he was. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, with, together with Tony Morel. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't see very much of him, of course, but uh, I saw his paintings all around the mission. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I have to say that unfortunately I didn't like them, mm -hmm. <coughs> uh, but that's my opinion. Mm -hmm. You were a painter too. Absolutely. Are you an artist? Yes, yeah. I've been a professional artist now since 1971. Mm -hmm. And uh, 25 years of career now, or more, and uh, doing very well now. Mm -hmm. And during your time in Vienna, you had also some exhibitions there? No. At the Celebrity Center of Hellwine? No. You made an exhibition there? Or? No, I was purely there as a staff member doing a mission uh -huh. at that time. And how it looked like at that time when you worked in Vienna for six months at the Maria Hilferstraße? Yes, I think. that's right. There was a mission. Mm -hmm. uh, what has been your job there? to run the course room and to re-establish the course room which had completely demolished itself 
with some dishonest staff members who had been there before. Do you know any names? No, I don't. No, no. no I don't. But I really enjoyed Vienna very much, and I love the Vienna, Viennese pastries. Yeah. <laughs> I love them. They still love it there. Oh, yeah. yeah. I like Vienna. I like Germany also. And then after six months, your mission was over? No, after a couple of months. In December 1975, uh, my mission was over, and I went back to Copenhagen, and um, I went from there to um, Daytona Beach, the mm -hmm. Flag Land Base, which was brand new. Mm -hmm. uh, at the time, I, they'd only been there like a week or something, or two weeks, maybe. Mm -hmm. So uh, that means L. Ron Hubbard arrived from his, uh, from his ship mm -hmm. in Daytona Beach. Yes. And then we also there, I think, Mike Rinder, the director of Office Special I, not, I don't remember seeing Mike Rinder there at the yeah. time, but I remember that I was um, <laughs> one of the first students there, and uh, my first introduction to professional training was with a whole room full of Class 12 auditors. Mm -hmm. And it was rather intimidating, because I was at the bottom end of the bridge, and they were at the very, very top. How far you have been at that time as an auditor? Only Dynetics auditor. That means auditor four, or? No, Dynetics is before, less, yes, less. before zero. Before zero? Before zero. So okay. I was at the bottom of the bridge, and... So why you sent they, uh, why did you send uh, uh, they over to, uh, from Vienna to, to Daytona Beach? Why? Because that, that was, I was going to go on the Apollo for training, but the Apollo had been abandoned. Mm -hmm. and they had come onto land in Daytona Beach as a new flag land base and not the flagship mm -hmm. anymore. So there was, there was a complete change of operating basis there. And that uh, means they rented a, hot, uh, a hotel there? Yes, the motel, the Neptune Motel on Daytona Beach. Mm -hmm. And it's funny because we had, um, I think it was from 11 o'clock to 12 o'clock each day, we were ordered to go swimming because otherwise it would look really, really weird with a whole motel full of people and nobody ever went to the beach. Uh -huh. It was really strange. So we had to go on the beach from that time just to show that we were kind of normal. <laughs> and <laughs> it was strange. And, and <laughs> this is really strange. And Aaron Hubbard and his wife stayed also in Daytona Beach at no, that time? No, they were not there. So you didn't met them? No, then. no, I did not. You never met him? No. Mm -hmm. I saw him in his car once in Clearwater in his gold Cadillac. Uh -huh. That's the only time I ever saw Ron Hubbard. Mm -hmm. I'm sure it was him. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> and how long have you have been in Daytona Beach? We were there about a month or so, month, maybe six weeks possibly, mm -hmm. and then we went in a collection of buses over to Clearwater, Florida, to uh, the new Jack Tar Hotel, which had been bought. Um, that means the Fort Harrison Hotel today. That's right, the Fort Harrison today. Mm -hmm. That's right. Um, at that time, we were given a briefing that um, we had to say to people in Clearwater, actually a lie, that this was bought by United Churches of Florida. And it was a group of churches um, in Florida that was there to promote religious freedom and this kind of thing. And we had to give this story. It's called a shore story. We had to give. We all knew that it was a lie, but we had to give that because we had orders to do so. Who gave you the order? Um, the, these senior officials in Scientology gave us a big briefing about it in the auditorium and told us exactly what we had to say to the people of Clearwater to hide the fact that it was really Scientology. Mm -hmm. And we had to be very, very careful about it. You mean the Guardian office gave to the order? Yes, yeah? that's right. The, the Secret Service of Scientology that's at right. that time? Yes, that's, that's correct. Mm -hmm. And why you made such a relatively fast career within the organization that you put the, all these places and they trust you so much? Why did I, that I happen? I don't understand the question. No, you made a career, good career, in, 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 in a short time. You, you yes. set on di different missions yes. and you even landed in 1976 uh, in Fort Harrison, mm -hmm. at the, the main world headquarter at that time. That's right. So how did, did that come? You have been a very dedicated scientist? I think I was very dedicated. Yeah. Very loyal and very dedicated and very... Uh, I was very much into the purpose of freeing mankind and uh, clearing the planet, so to speak, as I understood it at that time. <coughs> so you have been on staff? You have been a Sea Org member also? No, I was not a Sea Org member. I signed a contract once, but I never activated it, so it, it was never a uh, real situation. And they trusted you even uh, to go to all that places, even without being as young? They didn't have member? anybody else to send. That means they were short with people. Uh -huh. And then in Fort Harrison, what have you done there? Do you have been a pop pop uh, like a population officer there? No, no, I was a student. A student? I was a student. I was only a student at Flag Land Base. Mm -hmm. At that time, um, I was doing auditor training but to be a case supervisor and to do a lot of training. I did a tremendous amount of training in about 18 <laughs> months there. Um, it's funny because one of my, my twins or my partners in the training process was, was Quentin Hubbard. Mm -hmm. 
and we became very, very good friends because we were both British. And so we used to sit there and do our training drills together for hours upon hours upon hours. I really liked Quentin very much. The son of L. Ron Hubbard? Yes, the, he's the person who was found dead in the car in Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. And never determined who was it? or. I, th I believe it was a suicide. <coughs> I personally, I believe it was a suicide. Mm -hmm. um, he had just been busted by his father once again, mm -hmm. as far as I know. As far as what he told me before he left on that trip, mm -hmm. I saw him maybe two days before he left on the trip. To Las Vegas? Yes. And he said that he'd been busted down to nothing again from class 12, and he had to do all of the bridge again, he had to retrain everything for the second time. Yeah. And he, he was expressing to me his um, almost grief about it, about the fact that it was done with such heartlessness and such viciousness by his own father. He couldn't understand this. And so that's what Quentin told me before he left. I never saw him again. And then he made, committed suicide. Yes, I think so. Probably. I think so. Mm. He wanted to be a pilot. Yeah. He did not want to be an auditor. He did not want to be a senior Scientologist, and especially he did not want to be L. Ron Hubbard's son because it was such a, a, a liability for him. It was such a, how can I say, a very <coughs> difficult position to maintain, always being L. Ron Hubbard's son and not just himself. Mm. He couldn't stand that. He hated that. You know? So he was forced by his father and, 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 and by his mother to do that? Um, the impression I got was yes. Mm. Yes, indeed. He would like to have been a pilot. That's mm. what he wanted to do in life. Mm. Yeah. And the other kids also? I don't Arthur know. Hubbard, Arthur, um, Arthur I don't, I, he is very happy with his art. Mm -hmm. uh, Diana is very sweet. Um, mm -hmm. I had some conversations with Diana about my art at that time. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, Lucy, I don't remember the other one's first. Um, anyway, the fourth mm -hmm. one I don't really know. Mm -hmm. And so you worked and you earned some money no. during your time in, no. in Clearwater? No, zero. Zero? Zero. And they paid you nothing? No. No. They paid for my food and they paid for my um, some of my lodging. Um, in Copenhagen, there's a strange, strange thing in Copenhagen, um, I had to move out of the lodging, I had to pay for my own lodging because there were 13 people in one room. 13 people? 13, and it was a small room, like about 12 feet by 12 feet. There was only bunk beds in there, and you had to crawl across the bunk beds to get to the bathroom. And there was roaches and all kinds of stuff, and I said, in the end, I'm not doing this. So mm -hmm. I moved out to a guest house, and I paid for my own accommodations mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. my savings. And this one it was, it was horrible. Mm. It was revolting. But in Fort Harris, so you so you lived in Fort Harrison, in one of the rooms there. Yes. Yeah. Which are now hotel rooms and that's right. And rented to to public. They were public they houses. were rented at that time also. Um, they were rented to mostly um, people from the organisations, but the organisations <coughs> paid the hotel expenses, the food and the, the room mm -hmm. and the courses. And and as more and, and, and more publics come in, mm -hmm. so the staff had to move out of the rooms and getting. There were more and more and more staff per room. Uh -huh. We got it to about three or four, but that was maximum. Mm -hmm. During that time in the 70s, there uh, has already been existing um, this present camps, RPF things there? The RPF Portland. was there, yes. Oh, yes. Yes, 19, I was there in um, 1976 and a part of 1977 at Flag Land Base. And I often saw the RPF people, yes. It was, it was, I didn't like that. To see? No, because the friends of mine who I had really liked I couldn't speak to them, and they couldn't speak to me. And they were all dressed in these horrible blue uniforms, and they looked, frankly, very, very miserable. Mm -hmm. I knew these people beforehand, and they were very bright, enthusiastic people. And then suddenly in the RPF, they looked like as if they'd been half killed. They looked so depressed. And what they have to do is, it's, they have been like prisoners. Yeah? Um, they were maintained by their loyalty. They had signed billion-year CO contracts. Um, which is a strange contract, by the way, because it's only one-sided contract. It's, we, I will serve for one billion years Scientology and stuff like that, but there's nothing in return on this contract anywhere. It's like a one-sided contract. I mean, that's a, frankly, I don't think that's very balanced. It's so unusual, huh? But a billion years, yes. A billion years, yeah. It sounds like slavery to me. Yeah. Yeah. And the RPF people are black dressed or yeah. dark blue? Dark blue uniforms and always have to run everywhere and can speak to nobody. <laughs> And what kind of work they had to do? Um, gardening, uh, repair work, um, the dirty work, taking out the trash, mm -hmm. um, maintenance, um, re-carpeting, this kind of thing. Just like basically <coughs> maintenance stuff, 
and they had to do it as fast as possible. And where was their staying place? So they, in, in the garage. In the garage? It was in a, um, a windowless room or set of rooms in the garage on the second or third floor, um, which was in very dirty conditions. There's no windows in there. There may be ventilation, but there's no windows. It's very depressing. Is this, is this room still ex existing? Yes, it does. It's now it's a folder storage room. Uh -huh. And when they closed this RPF down? I don't, I don't remember. I wasn't there when they mm. did that. Mm. Are there also children in that RPF? I did not see any children in the RPF. Mm. No, I didn't see any. There may have been some. Mm. But not as far as I knew. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And after your time in the Fort Harrison Hotel, what happened then? Well, it was interesting. Um, I was doing my courses, I was going along pretty well. And suddenly I got um, removed from the course room. For no apparent reason so i had to go through two months of misery of not doing anything except write letters to pay for my room and my food while they decided what they're going to do to me mm -hmm. which was probably the most one of the most miserable times of my life because i was stopped from doing scientology for no apparent reason i didn't know why and they just suddenly said no you're, you're off and uh, i mean i was on purpose for this thing i wanted to do this thing desperately very much and in the end i had uh, so much emotional trouble I just I was just you know in tears sitting out on the lawn one day and one of my friends who was a class 12 auditor came over and said you know what's how it's happening what's going on so I told her what was going on and then she helped me and then from there I went back to Paris uh, to join staff there when was that um, 1977 mm -hmm. yeah. so you went back to Paris to, to uh, celebrity center there no to the organization to the organization I was not being an artist at any at this time You didn't paint it in, no. in, in, in that years. You only Just as a hobby, but not as a profession. Uh -huh. And what profession. happened in Paris? Um, I was there. I was given a, a, an administrative post um, a, to function in Paris organization. I stayed there for a little over a year. And then I wrote a letter to Ron Hubbard saying I really would prefer to do my art now <laughs> rather than be on staff. And so uh, he said, okay. So I left. So you wrote back to you, Ron yes. Hubbard? <coughs> yes. You think he personally? Or? Yes. For sure. Mm -hmm. I had I had quite a number of letters, maybe 30 or 40 letters from L. Ron Hubbard. You still have them? Uh, some of them. Mm -hmm. I didn't keep all of them, but I have some of them. Mm -hmm. And so he agreed that I could leave without being severely penalized. I had to pay $30,000 for my stay in the Fort Harrison and for my accommodations and my training there uh, in order to balance up the, the debt. Even though I had worked for one <laughs> year and a bit, almost free. My, my average salary was about $20 a week mm -hmm. for about a year and a half. My last paycheck from the organization was about 65 cents. So Mr. Fennison, in I think in 1976, 77, 77, I came back 77 to Paris. you came back to Paris yes. for uh, working in, in the organization in Paris that's right. for them. Yes, that's right, for about a year and a bit. And then okay. I left. And then you left, and Aaron Hubbard said, "Okay, you can leave, but uh -huh. so you have to pay back the money." Yes. Uh, for your. That was um, that was his condition. That, that I, if I paid things. back the money, then I could leave. Okay, and it was about thirty thousand dollars. And how you get the money together? Um, I borrowed the money, uh -huh. and I paid it back over a period of about ten months with my painting. Mm -hmm. And then you started to work as a as a professional painter, professional artist, artist. Okay. professional artist. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> but then you stopped also working. Uh, for the organization? That's right. You, I was never artist. a staff member again. Never. Since then, since never. 78, never again. So, uh, they tried to... I just to wanted to tell you, yeah. I, I think I mentioned before, but the last paycheck I got as a staff member was about 65 cents for the week. That's, that's really crazy. Yeah. I, I had to work elsewhere, <coughs> even though it was a full-time job from 9 in the morning till about 11 o'clock at night each, each day, seven days a week. And when I would try and, try and take a day off, they would come and get me from my apartment because I couldn't be replaced. <laughs> so he was kind of crazy. I was very happy to leave. <laughs> uh -huh. I can understand that, yeah. And then you, and then started your life as a public Scientologist. Yes, yes that's right. Is this completely different? Very different. Is this, in your opinion, is it better? Or is it... Well, <laughs> depends on your viewpoint. So what is the difference, or what has been the difference for you? Well, I had to pay a lot more. <laughs> you had to pay. <laughs> It was every week I was asked for money, every single week. In Paris? Paris or Copenhagen, wherever I was, wherever I lived. I think, I don't remember a week where I was not asked for money at some time. Mm -hmm. So you tried to go on the bridge? Yes. Up? 
on both sides. Yes. On the auditor side and yes, both and, of them. And on the I think train, training training side. Yes, yeah. that's great. Uh -huh. And uh, during that time, what level you had reached already in '78? '78, I was still a Dynet K supervisor. On the left side. On the what? On the left side. I don't remember which. which. I don't remember which is which now. That was the auditor side. Yeah. It's been a long time. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, on training side, and then I went. I did uh, my OT levels up to OT four in Copenhagen. Mm -hmm. That means the uh, the very hard course. I think it's it's, it's the OT three level. No? Mm -hmm. I did it in Copenhagen. You did it in Copenhagen. Yes. At that time. Yes. In seventy eight, seventy nine. Uh, yeah. No, actually, it was. <laughs> um, um, gosh, what year was that? Seventy nine or eighty. Mm -hmm. I was up in Copenhagen doing OT three, mm -hmm. OT one, two, and three. Mm -hmm. Is there, or do you recognize the difference between uh, the things which are happening until the OT, OT level, okay, until the clear level, and then and then it's changing? I think yes. going on from the from the clear level. It's a very significant difference. So what is the difference between these this beginner levels and the the, the upper levels? Well, at the, at the start, there's not much. Uh, and what is the content? What the, to explain? What what could be um, to explain to a normal? Non-scientology. Well, at, at that point, um, you suddenly get onto what are called confidential levels, and so you have to go through what is called an eligibility program, um, which basically <coughs> means to you have to obtain the approval of the senior Scientology officials in order to go on to that level and to be invited on. They're only by invitation, and so if you're not invited, you can't do them. Even if you pay as much money as you offer, no, you. no, it doesn't matter. That 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 might help a little bit, but it's not the mo the main thing. They'll probably say, okay, yes, we'll take the money, but that doesn't make any difference to your eligibility. And this starts from clear on. From clear, yes. And I've heard that it's um, also different. The OT levels are very hard brainwashing things. Is that right? Or? There's there's difficult <laughs> things to uh, to stomach on those particular levels. Um, it's not easy. It was a very hard time, but it was very rewarding because I felt I was getting somewhere with those. I mean, I, ha I had some spiritual gain during those things, yes, no doubt. And what does it mean, the OT level? Does it mean you're, you're, you're getting asked a lot of questions? Not really, not really. Those levels are basically designed, uh, they're called operating Thetan levels, which means basically a spiritual being, the Thetan, would be in an operating state instead of asleep in his head. Basically, it's a spirit, spiritual being who's the driver of the car, which is the body, and is trying to make the spiritual being more active and alert. Mm -hmm. That's why it's operating fate, which is OT. Mm -hmm. Okay. And between every OT level, you have to make security checks. A lot of That's security right. checks. That's right. Yes, yes. Unless you do them all at one time, in the same organization without a break, then you can go on. So what are uh, what are they doing with these security checks, or what? Uh, or how are they looking? Looking well, like, what can you ask? What do you have to do there? At that time, you had to go through basically um, every kind of uh, sin that you had ever committed, and to either write it down or tell somebody about it on the e-meter, um, holding the cans in a session. Um, but it's not a session in the, the fact that it's what you're saying is not necessarily confidential. Um, I thought at that time that I could trust completely the organization to keep that private as a parishioner to the church. That's what I thought at that time. Later experience proved that that was wrong. I could not trust them to do that. Mm -hmm. they, black, they blackmail you. Well, if they go out, they will bring something to the public. Um, uh, that happened in 1997, um, yes. At the it end, did. Yes, when, you, it did. when you finally went out. Yes. But that's a long... 1980 was a long time from then. So uh, in 1980, your career went on as an artist? Uh, yes, I was, I was uh, doing my career as an artist and I was selling my paintings mm -hmm. and I was using the money to pay for my Scientology courses. Mm -hmm. uh, does it mean that you mainly have customers within the Scientology organization, mainly? Um, not always, no. I had some. <coughs> and uh, sometimes it was a good percentage and sometimes it was a very low percentage. But I also had clients who were bankers in Paris, um, who were businessmen uh, in different countries, <coughs> but not all Scientologists. Mm -hmm. No, I couldn't survive on that. Not only in Scientology, no. no way to survive. No, because they gave most of their money to Scientology. Mm -hmm. They couldn't afford it. And how it went on, they invited you to do courses, to come to Copenhagen, to come to Clearwater. Mm -hmm. Yes. And uh, <coughs> you also make exhibitions at the different celebrity centers with your art? Um, at a later time, um, 1979 through, let me see, which year was that? About 1986, something like that. 
maybe 88, I, I did a tours, artistic tours to uh, different organizations <coughs> in uh, Germany, in France, Italy, Switzerland, um, all the Scandinavian countries. Um, I toured as a professional artist and I was invited by certain uh, organizations to come and give a show. And I gave a slideshow and um, with music involved and we had very, very successful um, events there. Funnily enough, that was some of the most successful events I ever did were in Germany. Yeah. My art was really, really appreciated in Germany very much. Where was it? All over. In different parts. München, Stuttgart, uh, Frankfurt, Köln. Do you know some people who have uh, been in charge during that yes. time? Yes, absolutely. So for example? Adelheid Gesche, Nina uh, Vogtli from München, uh, Gabi Corell from Stuttgart. Mm -hmm. um, George Eggers was at the time in, uh, in Köln. Um, some people in Hamburg, mm -hmm. and, uh, <laughs> many, many people. And uh, it was very interesting. I love the German people because they like my art. And how did that work? Did organization of, of that kind of show, did they call you? Or they or called me. They heard about it from other staff members in other organizations. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, they gave me a call and they said, you know, we, we'd like to do an event with you. And um, can you come as a celebrity? And um, we can give you a show in the organization if you will promote L. Ron Hubbard and Scientology in the event. Some events were in public places, like the Kunsthaus in Zurich, um, and other events were in the organization themselves, and they invited hundreds of people. Mm -hmm. And so I promoted Scientology as an artist, as a celebrity. Mm -hmm. I did this maybe 300 events. 300 events maybe. during your whole career as a Scientologist? Mm, yes, uh, 300, maybe 400. And you had to share the income of the sales? Or you sold no, I was not paid for these events. You haven't been paid. I was not paid for these events. Sometimes I got my plane fare, on, uh, sorry, not plane fare, my train fare. Uh -huh. a train fare and a hotel. They, were very, they treated me very well. Mm -hmm. I, I had no complaints at all. They treated me very well. I gave a good uh, art show and the people were very, very happy mm -hmm. with this. But I got to know a lot of people. And a lot of Scientologists know me. Like thousands and thousands of Scientologists know me personally. Mm -hmm. Due to this fact that you have been exhibited at these different places. That's right. And so you went on, going on in Clearwater, going up the, up the going up the different bridge, levels, yes. going up the bridge, right? And finally, you, you've made it up to OT7. Yes. And yes, that was in 1989. 1989. Uh -huh. And then I, I lived in well, I lived in several places at that time. I mean, in 1980, <coughs> 1983, I was living in Paris, and I had to move out of Paris at that time because um, <coughs> the atmosphere in Scientology was so bad at that time um, it, it appeared as if Scientology was being taken over by uh, some very very vicious people some criminal guys it seemed that way mm -hmm. it, something was so wrong mm -hmm. that the atmosphere was so bad that I said okay I'm, I'm going to not um, be in contact with any of these organizations anymore the reason for that was I was once at Celebrity Center in Paris in 1983. I was the last student on course. All the rest had left. They were all gone. They didn't want to come in anymore. Mm -hmm. I was the last one. And the supervisor was very, very, um, how can I say, uh, not, not just rude, but just vicious. And I, I complained that, you know, please don't be like that because it's not necessary. It's not mm -hmm. necessary to be rude or anything like that. And I was taken from there down to a room downstairs and I was put into a room with two C organization members who said to me, pick up the cans of the e-meter. Very vicious, like nasty. Mm -hmm. I said, I don't want to. He said, pick them up, otherwise you're going to be declared suppressive person immediately. So I thought, what is that? Expelled from the church for just not picking up some cans? Come on, give me a break, right? Um, one of the guy's names was Alec Meyer, I think. And another one was a French lady. I think it was Alec Meyer. Anyway, his name was Meyer. The German? Um, possibly or Swiss. I'm not mm -hmm. quite sure which one. Anyway, they had me go on the e-meter and they started asking me questions about my personal life to such an extent and so nastily that in the end I was in tears because I was so upset about what they were doing. Mm -hmm. And when I was really the most upset, they said, okay, you can go now. And so I left. <coughs> I learned the next day they had gone upstairs from that office and they had told all my personal secrets to all the staff in a meeting. So at that point, I decided I'm leaving Paris. I went to Monte Carlo to live for two years, mm -hmm. and I uh, did, did pretty well down there. Also as a Scientologist too? I was on OT7, so I was in contact with the flag land base, but nobody else. Mm -hmm. I was in like a hermit 
-hmm. And they wanted you. Hubbard Way, he was a oh. nice Scientology guy. Yeah. Right. No, Mike Rinder asked for it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, by the way, <coughs> I called yesterday to a person here, mm -hmm. and they said, I told them a story about Hemet. Mm -hmm. and they said, the newspapers said that Peter and his friend were arrested only. Yeah? Yeah. They only said that? And they said that only, the only arrest that occurred was that Peter arrested them and they arrested Peter. No police were involved. Is that that? It's in the newspapers. I don't know, but you can call Priscilla and ask her. Priscilla, Priscilla Coates. Coates. Yeah. Uh -huh. She knows, because there was a German guy there talking about it. Uh-huh. Anyway. Uh-huh. Okay, it's going on now. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so we are in, yeah, so we are in, in, in Monte Carlo. Yes, I was in Monte Carlo for two years. And you didn't work, and you didn't uh, use your auditor level for, for auditing other people. You did. No, I did. You haven't done that. No, I was a public Scientologist. That means you you don't do audit other people. No, mm -hmm. only yourself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's right. And you wanted to to make it to OTA now. I wanted to get as far as possible. OTA wasn't released at that time. Mm -hmm. There was only OT7 released, so I did um, all the levels up to OT7, mm -hmm. one by one by <coughs> one. And I also did um, one of the L rundowns, of like L10. L10, L11, L12. No, I only did one of those, mm -hmm. which was L10. Mm -hmm. And it cost me about 100 hours of auditing at about $10,000 per block of 12 <coughs> and a half hours. For doing that? Yes. It's also very hard critical questions something like this uh, question very anyway. hard questions yeah. <laughs> very hard questions but anyway it, it was it was fine it was fine yeah mm -hmm. so um, then they ask you to do OT8 well um, only after I did OT7 I finished OT7 and I was going to go home and a friend of mine says no no you should stay you should go now onto the ship and you should do OT8 mm -hmm. so I said okay so we got the money to get that was about Fifteen or twenty thousand dollars, I had to pay. Mm -hmm. and so I went on the ship, and I had to wait three weeks on the ship, paying a hundred dollars a day for them to get their paperwork straight. What kind of paperwork? To say that my eligibility was all right, and that I could actually do the OTA level. That means you are one hundred ten percent security checked from all sides. Oh, all sides. Uh -huh. Security check, left, right, center, up and down. Uh -huh. Every everything about my life is known and written down. Mm -hmm. And uh, nothing before you can do OTA. Yeah? Yes. yes. And then before any level. Before any level, yeah. But especially hard at OTA. Very, very hard. We uh, we were with several students, and we had a joke that it was like <coughs> walking between one cliff and another cliff mm -hmm. on a rope, and the ethics officer was the other end with a big pair of scissors. Any time he could just cut the rope and leave you down into the. That was that was the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. We joked about it, but it was very, very emotionally stressful. Very, mm -hmm. very stressful. Mm -hmm. You see, the reason for that is that in the beginning, when you start Scientology and when you do your courses, the um, message is that Scientology is the only road to total freedom. That's the message. But no other road works. Now, when you want to be free, you want to follow that road. So it puts a tremendous stress on you, having the only road possibly cut by somebody's whim or caprice at any time. It's very, very stressful. And ethics officers have the power to do that. The Religious Technology Center now has the power to simply <coughs> cut what somebody believes is their route to freedom, just like that. It can lead, that can lead to somebody to suicide. That alone, believe me, it's stressful. Yeah. So, so OTA, yes, I, I eventually, after three weeks of paying all this money and waiting around doing nothing, for three weeks. Cruising around the Caribbean Sea? Yes, I don't like cruises, so I mean, I just, it's just a nuisance for me. I would like to be on dry land. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so. And then they said, okay, now yeah, it's. Yeah, they said I can do it. Uh -huh. yeah. And how it went on? Um, then I had to get a security card um, with my uh, special pass. <laughs> and I got my invitation, and I went uh, up to the security guard at the door the next morning um, to go on course and um, had to show my pass to the security guard and put it through the, you know, the swiping machine. And I had to go through uh, two security doors and then uh, go to the course administration and um, show my invitation. And then they said, okay, now here's, the, here's how this works. Um, there's, a, there's a pack which you have, which is like a folder, plastic one. 
and it's, it plugs in in the course administration room to a computer, which is a security computer. And when we unplug this pack from the security computer, you have 30 seconds to get to your desk and plug it in at your place before the alarms go off for breach of security. So I thought that was rather amusing. So we did that, and we were, you know, had fun doing that. And then uh, I did my course. How long did it took? One day? Um, it, no, it didn't. It took about three weeks, but most of that was just stuff I'd done before. Mm -hmm. uh, it was things that I had um, already covered, like e-meter drills and uh, things like that. The actual OTA is probably just a few pages. Mm -hmm. Just a few pages. But I won't go into technical details, because that would be too long to explain. Mm -hmm. So, um, when came the point that you say, ooh, there could be something wrong with Scientology, did you never thought, uh, did you never had any critics from outside, did you never had any books, did you ever had any TV specials well, that the Scientology is, could be a cult or a criminal organization? Well, we heard that quite often, but we already had our um, mental preparation for that, in that there were, you know, bad people always trying to attack Scientology and, you know, collapse Scientology, and there were evil people all over the place. Um, this was L. Ron Hubbard's viewpoint on life, that there were people, he was basically, he appears to be, from what I've read, paranoid um, about his own security, um, and it seems to have rubbed off on others. Um, but uh, what is your question exactly? So how came the point when you said, mm, there's something wrong with Scientology, with the whole thing? Well, how did it start? It? How, how did about you? two months after OT8, um, I was doing fine for that two months, and then suddenly I was doing really badly. I mean, really badly. And so I wrote to my case supervisor, and she said, you know, she gave me a couple of hints, but there was nothing which would really help me very much, frankly. Who so was I, your case supervisor? Uh, Margaret Supak. Margaret Supak? Yes, Margaret Supak. And where, where is she working? In on the Free Winds. On the Free Winds. She was a senior case supervisor on the Free Winds. Mm -hmm. She but was my OT8 supervisor. Is she, is she the biggest supervisor? On, on the, the ship? ship, she was at that time, yes. That means only for the OT8 in charge for? Yes, that's mm -hmm. right. And uh, she was my supervisor at that time. And at the end of the year, um, I was doing really badly. I, I was not happy at all. Even with OT8, I was not happy. I was very stressed out and miserable. And so I decided to, of my own volition, <coughs> um, use my what I thought was my parishioner's uh, right to write up my sins, confess my sins, in writing, and send them. I send them to the ship. Um, How did you send it to the ship? By probably by Federal Express or something like that. And they got it sent through any island. Yes, through Clearwater. Mm -hmm. Yes, they send, always send it through Clearwater. Mm -hmm. So I sent these um, confessions, these written confessions, um, to Margaret Supak on the ship, and then I said, okay, I would like to come to the ship to have a little uh, ethics. Handling. I would like to do this of my own volition. Mm -hmm. And I got to the ship, and I was doing all right. It was going kind of okay. And then suddenly they stopped. They said, uh, you're going to have a committee of evidence now, because what you did was so bad. I mean, it's my own private life. It's my own personal thing. I didn't harm anybody else. But that, for, in their viewpoint, the Sea Org viewpoint, this was so bad, you know, I'd had a, a good time. And they said you're going to get a committee of evidence, which is like the highest justice procedure you can get, right? And so they said, okay, I'll do it. I didn't have anything particularly to hide. So I had a committee of evidence. I had to speak about my personal life and my sex life in front of five C organization members who were going to judge me. But it's an internal judgment system within Scientology. Yes, that's right. But how about develop? Yeah? Right. Mm -hmm. So they asked me questions about my personal life of the most intimate nature. And then he said, okay, now we're going to send this up to Los Angeles for approval of our findings. And I was sent home with no result. In the meantime, the president of the Celebrity Center in Paris, Mr. Rosenberg and Mrs. Rosenberg, went to the ship. I learned later that when they had gone to the ship, they had been invited by Mrs. Supak, or Mr. Rosenberg had been invited by Mrs. Supak to come in and hear about my confessions. My private, intimate confessions were given out to Mr. and Mrs. Rosenberg, or one of them. Apparently, this was told to me by Ms. McNocho, who was the ethics officer at the time. She told me this. And then, later, uh, next month, I started hearing about the contents 
of my confessions from public Scientologists in Paris. I thought, how did that happen? They were telling me what I had told. Mm -hmm. Like, I can't believe this. This was private. This was a parishioner church thing. Mm -hmm. And so I tried to resolve this, and it was it was very very hard because people, my friends, were calling me on the phone and saying, "Listen, um, I don't want to have anything more to do with you um, because you're such a bad person. I'm sorry. I'm I'm not going to be your friend anymore." This happened in many many cases. It was very very upsetting. And I had other people, I had an artist association where I had members of my artist association, which was perfectly legal. And they called me because they said, Mrs. Rosenberg has said, if we do not ask for a refund of my artist association fees, then she will not allow us to continue in Scientology because we are so-called out ethics. So they wrote to me and they phoned me to tell me to give them back the money for the artist association. And I had to refund them and I did. I did, but it was very, very upsetting. So I said, what is this? What's happening here, you know? And so I went to the Celebrity Center. Um, this was in April of uh, 1991. And basically, to cut a long story short, Mrs. Ro Rosenberg threatened me. She said, if you don't do, as an artist, what I tell you to do, and that's to stop doing this and do this and do this, basically she's trying to run my career. She said, I will cut you off from any Scientologist friends that you have. I'll take away your OT8 and I will take away your eligibility for being a Scientologist. And she did all of those three things. Slowly but surely, by covert means and by reports, which I later found, and I had everything documented on this, everything, every last document. It was basically a campaign of harassment and black public relations against me personally to destroy my career. And they did it. They destroyed my career in Paris. D directly. And, and what's the reason why they react in that aggressive way um, against your um, art association? Um, the artist association, basically what I found later was that um, what they believe as staff members and as Sea Org members are that Ron Hubbard has given them planet Earth. He said in 1975, this is our planet, move in. So they believed him, because they believe everything he writes apparently and so celebrities are part of the planet so celebrities also apparently even if they've never heard of Scientology they feel that they belong already to Scientology so I was doing an artist association which was going to contact celebrities for the art profession and help our profession mm -hmm. as celebrities as artists mm -hmm. artists helping artists and this was not under the control of Scientology therefore it had to be destroyed and they did a very good job on that and who gave the order? The Office of Special Affairs? Or? Um, yes, this part of it was the Office of Special Affairs in uh, Paris. Any names? There? Um, I don't remember. Uh, no, I don't remember the names right now. Mm -hmm. It's the same people who basically were in the Guardian's office before, who are now back again in yeah. the Office of Special Affairs in Paris. Mm -hmm. yeah, so it's a very similar group. Bernard Forrest for STA and Cécile uh, Barre. Mm -hmm. um, what's his name? Pascal. Something. I don't remember. Mm -hmm. Pascal Parizot. Mm -hmm. And what happened then after the? was down after they destroyed your, your connection? Well, basically what they did, they, 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 they filed internal reports on me which were false. Mm -hmm. And they did this in a way which I didn't know that they were doing it until it was too late. Mm -hmm. And when I found out it was already too late, they had already made an issue, uh, a publication saying that I was no longer OT8, I was no longer an OT, and that I was in disgrace. And they hadn't checked with me to see if I'd done these things or not, and I hadn't. I, hadn't, I was innocent of all the charges. You see? And that was what made it really annoying. So you lost nearly um, a 20 years, 18 years, 20 years ca career? Yes. And from one woman to the other of inside That's lost right. all your, all my your achievements, everything. Everything. Yeah? everything. Mm -hmm. I had paid a lot of money for that. I had spent a lot of time doing that. And it was also false. <laughs> because it was only because I did not obey Sarit Rosenberg in Paris that all this trouble now occurred. Mm -hmm. Because she's she's a person who's like that. And did you protest it that oh uh, God, this yes. is the top management? Of course. To whom did you? <coughs> of course, I wrote up every single thing. I had still have all of these documents. I reported to the Religious Technology Center. Um, every everybody. I had in the end. I had to cut a very long story short. Um, three committees of evidence. Four committees of evidence. Sorry. Two boards of review. Um, three or four security checks. Confessionals. Um, crammings, auditing, 
all to correct something which was not wrong in the first place. Yeah. You see? Not wrong in the first place. It's like nothing there. And that, that's the only thing that I could never get a recognition of it is that I was innocent of those charges. Mm -hmm. Even once, it's, this is kind of funny, but it was not funny at the time. In 1993, I think it was April, I was at the Flag Land Base and I was doing a confessional. It cost me about $15,000, I think, in total. And they, they gave me their best confessional auditor, the one that could miss nothing, um, Katie Heller. Wonderful auditor, wonderful person. And we did a confessional which was really very well done. Mm -hmm. And we found absolutely everything that there was to find. There was nothing left. And so they sent me to, um, to finalize. It's called a testing, the confessional. And I wrote what's called a success story yeah. after this confessional. And I said, I am so glad that I found that I was really innocent of the charges. Finally, it's a real reward and it's a relief to me to find this. You know what the response was that? You need more confessionals because you're still saying that you're innocent. So I had to have another six hours worth of auditing at $600 an hour to prove that I, it's like they could not accept that I was really was innocent of those charges. It's crazy. It, it was crazy. I mean, it really was crazy. You know? and, and did you try to contact David Miscavige, the leader of Scientology? Yes. And, uh, yes, many times. Even from 1991, I contacted Mr. Miscavige and he already knew about the situation. And um, he did help in 1991 to get a committee of evidence moved from the ship to Copenhagen. Mm -hmm. He helped on that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there was no other material help from him apart from on a board of review later. Uh, but that really didn't achieve anything. Yeah. Do you know whether um, uh, Miss Cavage is controlling the whole organization? Uh, it's my belief that he is. Mm -hmm. yes. He's controlling the whole thing? Uh, all of it. All of it? That's my belief. But he's saying... Um, RTC has nothing to do with uh, the other thing, but this, do you think it's a lie? He's in charge of everything. He's in charge of everything. He's the big white chief. Mm -hmm. Yes. Of all the organizations. Yes. Since Hubbard's death. Um, yes. Mm -hmm. As far as I know, yes. These are the people who took over uh, from the other people in 1983, mm -hmm. uh, especially at the Mission Holders Conference in, in San Francisco, mm -hmm. uh, which was a um, one of the most awful events in Scientology history. Mm. Um, one of the most, well, from reports that I've read on it, I was not there, I've read reports on it and I believe there are videos of it in, in the Religious Technology Center archives. It was a very, very oppressive event and something like 600 people lost their Scientology status. They were, mission holders were made to pay $15,000 a day for a special mission. Mm -hmm. Anyway, all these are documented in very, very authoritative books, such as Peace of Blue Sky by John mm -hmm. Atack, mm -hmm. etc. Mm -hmm. So I won't go into that here, because I don't know personally exactly about that. Mm -hmm. you see. So um, at the end, um, it took you years to prove that you're innocent, but they, they didn't believe you. No. Uh -huh. Six years of misery. I mean, real, real misery. In Paris, it got to the point... Six in years. Six nothing. years. Uh -huh. Yes. In 1993 in Paris, I had to leave Paris again because the, the, the atmosphere was so bad. Mm -hmm. I lost everything. I lost all my money. I lost my house. I lost my furniture. Everything I owned in Paris was gone. All of because of Scientology? Yes, because of the attacks by the celebrity center of the church in Paris. Some of the things I, they did there were like, you can't believe. It's like, is this science fiction or is it the mafia or what? You ask yourself the question. In, um, let me see, get my dates right here. 1991. Or was it 1991 or 92? I don't remember exactly. It was October. I was starting up a company. It was called the Real Affinity Company. It was making beautiful greetings cards. And I had a few staff members who were Scientologists who were partners in the company with me. I set up the company. We opened up the bank accounts. We did the uh, uh, paperwork. And we, we did our first trade show. Business was open. And we got some orders from customers. And things were going OK. And suddenly, this church so-called, in Paris, called the Celebrity Center, calls in my staff members, without my knowledge, and they say, Michael Pattinson really is not a person you should be associating with, you know, you shouldn't be in business with him, um, he doesn't like us, you know, and so they said, you should stop doing business with him, otherwise it could be very difficult for you to continue in Scientology, and so they stopped, mm -hmm. they liquidated the business, I had to buy up all the stocks myself, and the company collapsed, mm -hmm. that was one, that's a church directly involved in collapsing and crashing a valid lawful business 1991 or 92 with celebrity center paris 
My staff member's name was Bruno Spinozzi, so that you know, he's now dead from AIDS, by the way. Mm -hmm. uh, so it didn't help him very much. Mm -hmm. um, then in 1993, there was an unusual situation. I had just been to the maiden voyage of the Free Winds ship, and I had become what's called an OT ambassador, appointed by Mr. Miscavige and Mr. Lecevre. And I what, went home. What does it mean, OT? There was somebody who was supposed to be in their zone of living. I was the only one who came from France. I was the only person there from France. Um, it basically, it, you had to take charge in your area of keeping Scientology working in the area mm -hmm. and making sure that things are done right. Mm -hmm. Before I left the ship, the uh, ethics officer on the ship, who is now the captain of the organization who delivers the technology on the ship, What's Sharon Strauss, mm -hmm. just to be precise, gave me a copy of a document about Mr. Rosenberg saying that he had done administrative errors very, of a very, very serious nature and was having a committee of evidence. Now, a committee of evidence, you need evidence. So, when I went back to Paris, I made copies of the document which I had been given and I sent it out to OT8 people and a couple of other people who knew things so that they would be able to give evidence and write documents for this committee of evidence, if necessary. If they knew things, they should write it up. This provoked a reaction which I've never seen in my life from the Scientology officials. They believed I was trying to take over the Celebrity Center Paris. That was their belief, right? They went absolutely berserk. They called in my friends um, to tell them how bad I was. They called in, I don't know how many people, but a lot of friends of mine, they said, come in for an interview at this time. They sit down with Miss Olivia Pilo, who was the ethics officer, under the orders of Mr. Frank Rosenberg, and then Ms. Pilo gives out information which is false about me, saying that I stole this document from the church on the ship, stole it. And I'm trying to take over the celebrity center and yap, 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 all this kind of bad stuff about me. Mm -hmm. And then they say, what do you think of that? And the person, my friend, I think that's terrible. If that's true, that's really terrible. Oh, good. Will you please write up a report saying how terrible that is and that Michael Pattinson's doing these things, mm -hmm. you see? Now, this person didn't know except from them. It's verbal, it's all hearsay. Mm -hmm. So the yes, I'll write it up for you. And I received copies of all this garbage coming in, of all these people saying that I was a terrible person and that they're gonna you know, disconnect from me and um, that I was a really awful person. You know, this was very upsetting. I don't know if you can know how that is when you have that. I had, at one point, five Scientology organizations calling me at any time, day or night, even one or two in the morning, screaming at me down the phone. I mean, literally screaming from Flag, from the Commodore's Messenger Organization, from the uh, flagship, from Flag Land Base, from Copenhagen, from Paris Org, screaming down the phone for me to stop doing what I was doing. I thought, that's very, very interesting. All I've <laughs> asked for is information about Mr. Rosenberg. <laughs> you see what I mean? Yes, crazy. Very interesting. And so in the end, I had to uh, destroy all the copies that I had made. Mm -hmm. I still kept the original, because mm -hmm. that was not a copy. I still have that original, by the way, mm -hmm. if anybody wants to see it. But, but you have still been a, a dedicated Scientologist, up even to that in, point, in that time. Yes, up to that point, I was a dedicated Scientologist. I was really trying to do my best. Mm -hmm. I thought that Scientology justice procedures would, in fact, um, clear up the matter and resolve it completely. However, that was a mistake. Mm -hmm. to think that. And in the end, in, in October 1993, I had to leave Paris and go to Mexico, where I knew almost nobody, mm -hmm. just to have like a convalescence. Mm -hmm. Just get, get away from it all. Mm -hmm. It was so crazy, so insane. You've been a member in the International Association of Scientology. Yes, unfortunately, I'm still a lifetime member, but I intend to <laughs> change that. That means all the Scientologists are members in that organization yes. to, to make causes. It's the only possibility. Mm -hmm. Do you uh, have yes. to be a... Well, you get a 20% discount if you're a member, so yeah. it's, a, it's a good incentive. It's a good deal, yeah? Yes, well, I suppose so. And the, and this organization is planning the whole, um, or is financing the whole things, um, what's, for example, now going on against the German government? Uh, yes, that's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. Um, that is something which I registered my protest at when it first started. Against Germany? Yes. I thought that's the most stupid idea I ever heard in my whole life. What to do? To print full-page advertisements in the New York Times against the German government using my money and other Scientologists' money to create antagonism 
from a whole very powerful government like the German government. Mm -hmm. I thought that was one of, the, one of the most stupid things I'd ever heard of in my whole life. Mm -hmm. And I disagree with it completely. And this has been discussed, uh, this thing, uh, to go against the German government within the IRS, with the, with the organization, do you have anything to do with that? No, no the IAS, uh, whose headquarters is on the ship, the Free Winds, uh, under Mr. Mrs. Janet Wright, um, is an independent organization um, of international scope. Um, they do what they want. Mm -hmm. They do not consult the Scientologists before they do what they want. They tell us what they have done. Mm -hmm. And they are in charge of strategy, and they do it. That means the strategy against Germany has been made up on the ship, or in the other headquarters here in Los Angeles. Frankly, I don't know, but I would imagine that it would be with consultations between Mrs. Light and uh, the executives of the IAS and executives such as Mr. Miscavige. I would imagine, mm -hmm. and the major board <coughs> members or senior executives of Scientology would decide such things. My understanding, from what I've heard in Scientology, is that Mr. Miscavige is above everything and controls the entirety of the entire Scientology pyramid. He would be the eye at the top of the pyramid, if my understanding is correct. Mm -hmm. and, and the thing against Germany, um, is, it, uh, is it like this, that they need some, some new enemy? Because the old enemy, the Cult of Awareness Network, has been, has been already destroyed, that they well, now need to get some it, more it, money out, to squeeze well, out of the members? It's an interesting point. We had just won the war against the IRS. And that had just been won. <coughs> Mr. Miscavige gave a, <coughs> um, a lecture in FLAG where he was saying that one time uh, before he was going to take a plane in, in Washington, he was there with his other executives and they had some free time. So they went to the head of the IRS to discuss uh, <coughs> getting a settlement with Scientology. And they did this and they met with them in the building in, in Washington. They went in just directly to reception and said, we're the heads of the Church of Scientology, we would like to see the directors of the IRS. They told, I remember hearing that twice as a story. Even though I've heard it's been denied since then, which is most amazing. Um, so then the war was won. Suddenly, there are big one-page advertisements going out in the New York Times about Germany I think, why? Why would you want to stir up trouble from a government which is very powerful, um, very efficient? Um, why would you want to do that? And my only possible response is that they needed another war because the statistics of the receipts from the IAS went so down. After we won the war, the donations went crazy. They went down mm -hmm. very steeply because Okay, the war's over, we don't have to pay our money in. You know, $40,000 a membership for a patron <coughs> anymore. You have any patron? No, no, absolutely not. So they decided... It seemed that they needed another war in order to get more donations. That may or may not be true, I don't know, but that's what it appeared to be. And I had nothing to do with it. I would have nothing whatsoever. I did not donate one penny, not one penny. <laughs> Against Germany, yeah? No. Yeah. And do you think the uh, members have been pushed? At, uh, and you think the members have been pushed uh, uh, to pay money in the IRS? Pushed? Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. I know people who have been kept in rooms for hours upon hours upon hours, upset, crying, trying to get out. And in the end, they had to pay $40,000 just to say, okay, I can get out now and I can. And then they're congratulated and rewarded and they had tears in their eyes and they think, oh, great, yes, I've done something wonderful. <coughs> and then next week, If you didn't pay any more, sometimes the IAS people don't even speak to you because mm -hmm. you're not still paying. Mm -hmm. And at the end, you you left in well, 19... Well, that's another story that's too, another but it would story. take more than three minutes to... I think we have only... And in 1996, you got arrested in Fort Harrison, is that true? For a couple how, of how hours? How much time do we have left on that? We have to just drive enough time for this. Okay, for very good. Important. Okay. But uh, at the end of 1996, you got arrested for a couple of hours, maybe, I don't know how. Um, I was uh, in 19, well, first of all, in 1991, I was kept on the free winds. Um, unless I paid $7,400, I could not get off the free winds because they kept my passport from me until I paid. I did not want the auditing which they wanted, I already had it. And I, I had to, in the end, pay them $7,400 in order to get off the ship and go home. I had two hours of auditing, which was basically worthless to me. That was that was like being a prisoner. 
And then in 1996, June 19th, um, I went to the Fort Harrison Hotel and I was held in a room against my will for an hour, an hour and a half, something like that. I tried to get out twice and they said, you're not getting out of this room until you have paid me $7,400 because the case supervisor says you need auditing and you must have it. Who taught you that? Um, Hi Levy, the registrar. And Cosima was there, the ethics officer was there too. I did not want the action, I'd already had the action. I was innocent of the charges. And in the end, I had to escape, physically escape the room by pretending to run to one door and they tried to block it as they had already, already done. I ran out of the other door and I ran up to the street, up to the Osceola Avenue and they were chasing me all the way to try and get me back so I paid this money until I got in my car and I just drove off. So that's one example for how they treat people? Well, they treated me like that. And, and other people too? Uh, I don't know about other people. I would yeah. imagine that it wouldn't be different for other people. But just an example for how they treat people the whole time to get, um, to get power? Well, the, the registrar interviews are a very, very uh, stressful thing. Uh, often you will be in the middle of auditing and you want to continue auditing and suddenly you're sent to the registrar, the inscriptions person, they say, okay, well, you need to pay another $7,000 or another $15,000 or $20,000 before you can continue. And you're right in the middle of something, you, know, you don't want to do this, like going to banks and credit cards and mortgages and you know selling your grandmother and this kind of thing, you know? I, mean, I would have sold my grandmother, but she was already dead, unfortunately. You know? <laughs> um, right, yes. right now, we don't treat you anymore. We have What's to stop right now because of the light. Oh, we do? Yes. No more light. Right, hold on. Okay. Go ahead. That was in 1990. Okay, in 1995, 1996, I'm sorry, uh, at the end of 1996, I was doing an ethics handling because um, basically all the OT8s had been told to come back and redo OT7 because there was something wrong with it. I was trying to do this, but I did not have my eligibility. So I was doing my eligibility program, and I was talking to um, the person who was doing my eligibility program, who was Danny Keel, who is Lisa Marie Presley's first husband. And so he was helping me um, doing this ethics handling. I was talking to him about my Christian religion, and how I loved it, and how I was really very, very, very happy with it. And suddenly, I was taken from the ethics office down into a small room by the reception of the Fort Harrison, into a very small room, like maybe five feet by six feet, with Mr. Marty Rathbun, who was a very senior security officer under Mr. Miscavige. And suddenly, I was being asked very intimate details about my religious beliefs, the Christian religious beliefs. And he was saying, on the, on the e-meter, it was like an interrogation. It was like an, uh, something from the war. Who have you been speaking to about your religion? What did you tell them? You know, this kind of thing, like nasty questions. Um, don't you understand that Scientology is also a religion and you shouldn't be talking about other religions here? And um, It was very intimidating, very intimidating indeed. There was two interviews, one for about two hours and one for about one hour. Which was very, very upsetting mentally indeed. It was basically what I would call a religious deprogramming. This was a, definitely a religious deprogramming done in the Fort Harrison Hotel by Mr. Rathbun of Religious Technology Center. He said to me, basically, if I did not give up my Christian beliefs and stop talking about them, I could not go on in Scientology because he would not give me the eligibility authorization. <clears throat> when I understood this, I said, well, Mr. Rathbun, what about those Shinto people who just came to Flag Lane Base to be Scientologists and to proclaim Hubbard as the Messiah? which they did. <clears throat> I said, what about their religious beliefs when they come to their OT levels? He said, it's not a problem right now. So I understood from this interview that Scientology intended, or does intend, to one by one stop every other religion on the planet except Scientology by the means of the eligibility programs of the Religious Technology Center. One by one, you cannot go on in Scientology unless you give up your religion. I thought I could be a Scientologist and a Christian or a Buddhist or whatever. Apparently, from what Mr. Rathbun said, this is not true. This is not true at all. At that point, I left Scientology. I said, if that's a choice between Scientology and Christianity, forget it. I'm out of here. And then you left the room? Yes, I left. And your story was over? That's right. That's right. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Don't have to
Just to prove my, my credentials. And you have been number 837. Is that what it says? Yeah. The number 100 in front. In February 1990. Yes. It's 837. And the photo of David Miscavige with him together. Yes, do, let's do stop too. now.